Good evening. This is the August 23rd, 2010 meetup of the Austin Constitution Meetup Group. I'm John Rowland. The topic this evening is what can be nullified. If you've been with us for some of our previous meetups, you know that we've discussed the proposal for setting up super grand juries, what are sometimes colloquially called the nullification commissions. Uh, the official title I propose is uh, Federal Action Review Commission, but whatever we call them, they are essentially a uh, body, 23 persons, who hears complaints from citizens about federal uh, violations of the Constitution. <clears throat> and if it finds that the Constitution has been violated, it can issue a finding to that effect, and the effect of that finding is to require all state agencies and contractors to refuse to cooperate with the federal government on that area of usurpation. It also encourages citizens of the state to uh, ref also refuse to cooperate with it in any way that may arise in the course of their daily lives. <clears throat> in effect, it puts the entire state and its people into a civil disobedience group. Uh, instead of individuals refusing to cooperate individually, or perhaps in small groups, and being picked off by a much larger federal government, it puts the entire state into a concerted effort. And the thought is that if enough states can do that, they can effectively bring the usurpations to a halt. So what we're going to be doing this evening is examining what usurpations are particularly susceptible to state-led nullification. Not all of them are. So we need to pick our battles carefully to figure out which uh, usurpations can be addressed effectively in this way and which ones may require other approaches. <clears throat> We're going to be following, brought generally, a certain analytic outline in this discussion. First of all, we're going to identify the usurpation itself. We're not going to spend a lot of time explaining why it's a usurpation. If you've been to constitution.org or have viewed my previous videos, you should have some idea of why these things are unauthorized or unconstitutional. Then, <clears throat> in general, we'll, we'll cite the uh, alleged authority for the usurpation. What do feds claim is their authority for doing that? We're not accepting their, that claim, but we are examining it because it may provide a clue to what we need to do about it. Then we're going to be looking at the impact of this usurpation on people, uh, how it affects their lives, and uh, find that next we're going to look at what kind of cooperation is required at the state level by state government, uh, by state businesses, and by state citizens. Next, we're going to try to look at the intervention points available with and without the proposed nullification commission. Now there have been a number of proposals for the state legislature to simply adopt legislation directly to try to block federal usurpations, but for a variety of reasons that will usually not work. Once in a while it might, but <clears throat> 
by and large, is not an approach that's feasible for most of these uh, violations. Then we're going to be looking at likely scenarios. How these efforts might play out uh, on the ground from day to day, from week to week, month to month, year to year, uh, looking at the ways in which they interact with each other, the various political forces involved, uh, what we can expect to build in the way of support, and what kind of opposition we may expect. <clears throat> but let's look first at some historical examples of uh, abuses which were uh, faced with some kind of state-level opposition. The first was in 18, 1798, the Alien and Sedition Acts. These were acts that uh, made it empower the president to uh, deport foreigners arbitrarily without due process. And the Sedition Acts made it a crime to criticize government officials and was used against several of the leading newspapers at the time, especially one uh, for which the publisher was a guy named Beige, who was the grandson of Benjamin Franklin. And that newspaper criticized the president, then president, John Adams. So uh, the result was a firestorm of opposition led by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. It led to the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions of 1798, the Kentucky Resolutions of 1799, and the Virginia Report of 1800. Now, in the Kentucky Resolutions, nullification, although not by name, was proposed. Uh, it was it was mentioned in 1799, but uh, most, only the states of Kentucky and Virginia were really on board for that. Still, they did have an influence, and uh, it was arguably enough that it tipped the balance and got Jefferson elected president in 1800 and caused the, his supporters to be swept into Congress to have most of the incumbents thrown out. And uh, he proceeded to undo the damage of the Alien and Sedition Acts, pardoning those who had been convicted and so forth. The, uh, but the plan was set down, the, plan, the idea of state-led civil disobedience, which has come to be called nullification. The next major time it came up, and this is, there were other times in between, but one that is often discussed, was when South Carolina uh, passed a law uh, blocking enforcement of the tariff at the time, which put a severe tax on imported goods needed by the South in order to favor more expensive manufacturers in the northern states. Uh, this affected the ability of the southern planters to make a living, to make a profit, and it was clearly designed to favor one section of the country over another, contrary to the constitutional provision that requires that uh, all legislation, in particular taxing, taxing legislation, shall be uh, passed and applied only in a way that provides for the general welfare and does not advantage one section or state over another. So they can, South Carolina considered that tariff to be unconstitutional, 
on those grounds. Now the way that would resolve is that the, the, the South Carolina resistance was considered important enough because it was threatened, because other states threatened to adopt similar measures, that Congress backed down and uh, greatly reduced the tariff down to a fairly low level. And uh, so South Carolina didn't have to follow through on its threat. But the reason why South Carolina's action could be effective in, that, in 1832 was because in those days, the federal government depended, for the most part, on the cooperation of state officials to enforce federal acts. And if a state if it, and its officials resolutely refuse to cooperate, they could pretty well end any of the efforts of the federal government to enforce its laws. Uh, that was later to change, as we, as we will see in later. The Fugitive Slave Acts, uh, between about 1850 and 1861, uh, were acts which provided for returning fugitive slaves to their owners, but the states insisted on holding jury trials to determine whether the slaves were in fact slaves, alleged slaves. They said, well, we have free blacks, we can't just have somebody coming into our state claiming they're a slave and, you know, yanking, you know, kidnapping them and taking them back to some to slavery in some southern state, we have to hold a hearing with a jury to decide, you know, what's going on. And the problem with that then is that, the southern for your point, is that southern, northern juries refused to find in favor of the slave owners. So they engaged in nullification of the Fugitive Slave Acts. And this was a major source of irritation that led to uh, secession of the Civil War. <clears throat> During the Prohibition era, 1919 to 1933, uh, there was also a growing problem that uh, juries began increasingly to refuse to convict people for violations of uh, alcohol prohibition. And without the ability to convict anyone of uh, prohibition violations, it became extremely difficult to effectively enforce prohibition. And finally, uh, uh, the people realized their mistake and repealed the amendment. Now, we currently have two areas of contention that are particularly instructive. The first is the Real ID Act, and the second is mar medical marijuana. We'll be looking into those in a little bit more detail. The Real ID Act requires states to issue driver's licenses and state ID that conform to federal requirements for centralized identification, but without funding to the states to pay for it. Uh, the Congress figured, well, the states have to issue uh, driver licenses or state ID anyway, so let's just impose a requirement on the way they do it, to require that they include things like social security numbers and generally uh, are tied in to a central federal data database of, uh, uh, that identifies everyone. Now, of course, as anyone who may have seen the movie uh, star starring Sandra Bullock, uh, in which her identity was stolen and given to someone else because of the ability of some someone in a position to control identities can realize 
the idea of having identity under the control of a single central authority is extremely dangerous to liberty. The alleged authority for the Real ID Act is to withhold entry into federal facilities and on a commercial aircraft to those not having the ID. Uh, it was thought that by withholding those privileges, uh, it, the people would demand that their states implement the Real ID Act. But that hasn't happened. In fact, the people uh, told a lot, a lot of them told their states, do not cooperate. We do not want you to issue uh, ID that complies with the Real ID Act. And a lot of states, including Texas, started resisting. Uh, most of them using the uh, excuse that they can't afford it. That's too expensive, that uh, without funding, we're just not going to do it. So, uh, and there's even a Supreme Court case that uh, sides with state and local officials who uh, refuse to administer federal statutes uh, without being paid for it. Now, that alleged authority to control aircraft was based upon two clauses, the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause, and by one court president, primarily one, Wickard v. Filbert which we'll just refer to here as Wicker. Uh, Roscoe Filburn was a farmer who uh, was prosecuted criminally for eating his own corn, which he grew in excess of the uh, price and production controls imposed on his farm. Uh, he argued that since it was not, uh, did not enter commerce, that uh, it was not properly subject to regulation by the federal government. Uh, it was produced in his state, consumed in his state. It wasn't sold to anybody. If it hadn't been produced, he wouldn't have sold it. Uh, and if he hadn't e eaten his own corn, he wouldn't have bought it from some, somebody else. Well, the Supreme Court in 1942 did not support Filbert, and uh, it established a precedent on which almost all federal uh, criminal legislation has since been based. If you hear about the over-criminalization or the federal criminalization of uh, everything, uh, that's mainly based upon that one court decision, Wicker, which most constitutional scholar that I respect consider to have been wrongly decided. So, the situation we have with Real ID now is that many states are refusing to fund compliance, but some are complying. So we have a mixed situation. If just one state refused it could probably be isolated and uh, forced into submission. But it's enough states. So it indicates that uh, any system of state-led uh, non-compliance, civil disobedience, needs to involve more than one state if it's to be effective. One is not enough. All 50 is probably out of reach, but it may be feasible with 10, 15 states. It doesn't have to be a majority, especially if they're the larger states. Now, the feds are hinting at withholding funds to states for other purposes unless they comply, taking advantage of the economic distress. Uh, a lot of the states are knocking on the doors of Congress looking for bailouts, and Congress is liable to say, well, 
if you want money from us, uh, we want you to go along with real ID. So, uh, of course, Texas is not in that position. And several other states are not. But it does indicate that uh, the uh, a use of extortion in that way is clearly unconstitutional and uh, needs to be resisted. On the other hand, if you were to try to uh, the state, or for that matter a private citizen, were to try to uh, sue, and some of them have, to block real ID, they generally get knocked out for lack of standing. Back in 1923, the courts adopted the doctrine that if you haven't been personally injured, uh, we don't want to hear from you. If we don't want to hear, we don't want to issue advisory opinions on what statutes are and are not constitutional. Uh, we don't want you running to the courts every time you lose in Congress. We want you to uh, fight your battles with Congress and get to, and settle them there, and only come to us when uh, you know you have a personal injury. Well, that's not the standard, the doctrine that was intended by the founders. They clearly intended that any citizen should have the right to go to court and get at least a declaratory judgment, and perhaps injunctive relief, if he anticipated unconstitutional legislation. But since the decision in question, uh, Farlingham v. Mellon in 1923, the Supreme Court and federal courts have been refusing to hear cases of that kind. And a companion case, Mellon v. Uh, you know, from Massachusetts v. Mellon, held that a state may not represent one of its citizens and the rights of those citizens. It used to be that a state could do that, it could go to court in what's called a, a in, in parents patriae. In other words, they could stand for the citizen and defend his rights in federal court. And in Massachusetts v. Mellon, the Supreme Court said no, citizens have to come and uh, conduct their own lawsuits. You can't do it for them. Now I didn't say that a state couldn't pay for the citizens' lawyers, it just cannot actually provide, speak for them in the name of the state. Now, where do we stand at this point? Well, we have an act still on the books, but too many states blocking compliance. So it's in legal, legal limbo. And uh, what we can expect in a situation like that is for the feds to try to ratchet compliance to pick away at the resistance, picking it off you know, state by state until uh, they get it, it's down to uh, too few states to be able to sustain it and then force the rest into compliance. So uh, this situation is still unsatisfactory. Now, <clears throat> now where would Real ISD stand if we had a nullification commission. Well, first of all, the citizen could have complained to the nullification commission before the Real ID Act was passed. There's nothing about a grand jury, which is essentially what it is, that says that it won't hear complaints about things that haven't happened yet. Uh, grand juries are uh, very well suited to, they can investigate anything they want to, including things that may be far in the future. And they don't have to limit themselves to cases in which somebody's actually been injured. 
Now, it would not be appropriate for it to find the act null if it hadn't been passed yet, but it could conduct hearings and call witnesses. Now, those witnesses could include both proponents and opponents of the act. Now, of course, the proponents might refuse to testify. Most of them are out of state. And uh, uh, Texas is not going to be able to go out to Washington, D.C. and drag them back to testify. But it can take note of the fact that they refuse to testify and decide the point, the argument, without them. So they would probably conf be confronted with uh, the possibility that the state could uh, declare it unconstitutional. Uh, they might want to show up and try to argue for why it is constitutional. Now you notice that there's a, you're beginning to notice, or should, that there's an important difference between the kind of nullification commission we're proposing and that of a committee hearing in Congress. Uh, having helped run committee hearings in Congress myself, I know how stacked they are. Uh, Congress is not really in general interested in getting information by having witnesses testify before it. That's mostly a facade. Uh, the real information on which it makes decisions, it gets through other channels. Uh, that's just a way by which it can line up people in support of, of, of the position, and maybe a few in, in opposition to it, who are carefully selected to uh, produce an overall effect that the powers that be in Congress wanted to. So it is not a, an objective, impartial process. And the idea of the Nullification Commission is to provide a, an impartial forum in which the merits of an issue can be debated. Now, what would have happened to the Real ID Act? Well, if a state nullification commission, and especially as several of them, had decided to hold hearings on it, faced with likely nullification, the act would probably have been withdrawn. Uh, it just, you know, Congress does not like to pass things that are going to generate a lot of opposition. It can take a certain amount of heat. But if it's got, but it's usually counting on uh, private groups to be the source of opposition. And if it's facing an entire state or several states, that changes the balance considerably and makes it uh, much more likely that they would cave in. Now let's, get, let's look at medical marijuana. It's illegal under federal acts based upon the Commerce, Necessary and Proper Clauses, and Wickard v. Filbert. However, some states legalized medical marijuana under their own laws. Now, we have a conflict developing. Some guys think they're authorized or even licensed by state law while the feds are trying to prosecute them. When the feds prosecuted for what the state authorized, we began to see juries refusing to convict. By having the state uh, legalize medical marijuana, it informed the public of the issue to a sufficient degree that when they began to be pulled for jury duty, uh, it would became hard to get a jury panel that would convict. So, the feds decided recent, fairly recently to stop prosecuting in those states. But they still can. Uh, 
the Nullification Commission would have gotten, gotten that resolved faster, and it would have gotten it for all states, not just for a few states, eventually. Particularly if uh, the example of a few states using a Nullification Commission caused the idea to spread until most, if not all, states insisted on having their own, or their citizens insisted on that they have one. Now let's look at the Health Care Act, which it has a longer name, but we'll just uh, abbreviate it here for this discussion. This is the one that has led to a lot of demands for nullification. Unfortunately, it's the one thing that does not lend itself to nullification as well as some of the other usurpations do. To understand why, we need to examine the act itself. What the act does, as so many people have said, there are many things that have people have said about it, but uh, one in particular is that it mandates people to get health insurance or to pay, pay a fine. Uh, now, some have proposed state legislation to block collection of the fines, even making it a criminal offense for a federal agent to try to collect them. The problem is that those proposals are designed for a different act than Congress actually passed. In the act, it specifically says that the IRS, which is charged with collecting the fines, may not file liens or take collection actions for the fines. So, we have a fundamental problem. If the IRS is not going to be able to file liens or take collection actions, uh, how is it going to collect them? And what could the state do to block that effort? Well, unfortunately, the IRS has other ways of collecting money from people. It doesn't have to levy on bank accounts or file liens on real estate or anything like that. It can just have employers deduct withholding from people's wages and then charge the money thus collected for the fines, leaving them a balance owing. So what is the state going to do about that? Is it going to block income tax collection? Because now the feds will say, now, no, no, we're not trying to collect on a uh, health insurance fine. We're collecting regular income tax. Is the state really going to try to prevent that? If it is, then it places, it's, it's up against the entire federal income tax system. So let's look at the income tax and the, Fed, and the nullification commission. Uh, now, it could certainly be possible, and in fact it would likely happen, that a state citizen would complain that the federal income tax on labor is unconstitutional. Now you notice that I restricted someone here. I'm not examining in uh, taxes on corporations, or inheritances, or on a lot of other things. We're just focusing on one thing, uh, income tax on labor, in particular on wages, because the feds have a withholding system they impose on employers, which can enable them to uh, get the money first, and so that you're put in the position of having to argue with them to get it back. Uh, the Nullification Commission could hear issues in the way that Congress and the courts 
refuse to and find it unconstitutional. Right now, Congress is not going to find the income tax unconstitutional, and neither are the federal courts. It's not going to happen. Uh, but what, in what ways does the IRS depend on cooperation by the states? Well, it files liens with state court clerks, which the Nullification Commission could block. Uh, however, that would not prevent federal agents from collecting anyway without the liens. Uh, state agencies and contractors withhold taxes, and the Nullification Commission could tell them, don't collect withholding taxes, which would put them in a direct conflict with the federal government. Uh, and the question then occurs, if the, the state refuses to uh, conduct withhold taxes, then I guess the feds could withhold money that they pay the states, which they're not supposed to send them anyway, but you can see that this would be heading toward a kind of a, a severe confrontation. Now, the IRS attaches money from bank accounts, but the Nullification Commission could have state, state bank charters suspended. In other words, it could tell banks, do not uh, give the money to the feds, to the IRS, uh, protect your customers, and don't go along with what the IRS asks you to do. Again, a direct confrontation. Uh, and of course, if banks have other alternatives, they could recharter with the federal government. Uh, then you'd have the problem of the state having to take the position that a bank can't do business in its state without being chartered by the state and then just ignoring the federal charter. So, you know, we're talking about some serious confrontation here. Uh, the Nullification Commission could encourage juries not to convict, but the IRS still has civil actions. The IRS gets your money that makes you sue them to get it back. In a, such a civil case, a jury is possible, but it is for all purposes, all practical purposes, blocked. It's very hard to win a case like that, because they, again, the federal judges will not let you argue most of the issues, the legal and constitutional issues, to the jury. So, without the Nullification Commission, most people cannot afford the cost of a suit like that. It could cost them a million dollars. They might have to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. And that would only be worthwhile if the amount of taxes at issue was less than a million. Well, that might be okay for a few really big, uh, you know, really wealthy uh, litigants, but for most people, they just couldn't afford to do that. However, the Nullification Commission could authorize paying attorneys to defend the citizen, even a little one, and confront the uh, IRS and the federal government with having to defend hundreds or thousands of lawsuits for that would cost them a lot more money than they're collecting. So they would be faced with going in the hole on litigation. Uh, this is a, an example of a, of a realization that a lot of people come to when they examine how the justice system works, that more often than not, the outcome is determined not by the legal or evidentiary merits, but by who runs out of money first. And the, uh, the, the government, by making it necessary for people to spend more money than 
the amount of money at issue is, is worth can effectively avoid a lot of litigation that would otherwise drain their resources. Uh, by reversing the cost factor, by, and of course the, the states would have to put out a lot of money to make this work, but uh, if they're willing to do that, then they could put the federal government in a position where it would cost it more money than it would get through trying to uh, collect taxes in this way. So, <clears throat> at this point, I think we're beginning to see that if the federal income tax on labor is to ever be tackled by the Nullification Commission, it's probably not one of the first usurpations the Nullification Commission should tackle. Uh, it could hold hearings, but defer the finding, putting pressure on Congress to replace the federal income tax on labor. In other words, a grand jury does not necessarily have to uh, produce a finding, what's called a presentment. It can hold hearings, uh, it can hold here lots of hearings, uh, month after month, year after year, uh, through successive grand juries, successive nullification commissions, building up a long record of testimony, uh, which is gradually leads up to the risk that eventually it's going to decide to issue a finding and then uh, let us say the matter would become very interesting. Hearings would provoke public discussion and very likely lead juries to refuse to convict even without the finding. Uh, I would anticipate that a nullification commission is going to be newsworthy. Uh, they might only meet, they might meet as often as once a week, but what they produced in a given week would li very likely be something the newspapers would want to cover. It would be the topic of discussions and discussion forums everywhere. People on the street would talk about it. Uh, people would rally it you know, in front of capital steps on the subjects, uh, it would lead a general uh, buildup of pre public pressure that you just can't get with private groups alone trying to sponsor such efforts. And of course, without criminal convictions, collections would fade. So you have a problem that if you remove an important tool for enforcement, you uh, lose the ability to use the other tools that they might have. Now let's look at federal education funds. There are mandates uh, involved in education funds received by the federal government, by the Department of Education. But they all depend on the states accepting those funds, for some kind of localities directly. Uh, if the states and localities did not accept the money, they wouldn't be subject to the mandates. Uh, we can argue about the constitutionality of using federal funds in this way, but we can uh, understand that if this does not lend itself to litigation or legislation in the usual way. Uh, all you, you can litigate, you can, elect, can legislate non-acceptance of federal money, but you can't really challenge the mandates if you do accept the money. Now in the case of Texas, the state standards 
are higher than the federal standards in some areas like civics, which is one of the reasons why uh, Governor Perry refused the federal money recently uh, and the states and the federal standards that would go with it. The Nullification Commission could find federal funding only valid for militia. That would be the most correct uh, finding it could make on the subject. And of course one could certainly find that almost all public education was militia training. However, if public education is militia training, then it has to be, have a focus on training students to be warriors and enforcers of the Constitution. Uh, they can't just be consumers, uh, meekly uh, going along with what the politicians want them to do and believe. Uh, the next issue that's often brought up in this connection is environmental protection. Uh, the states and the, the, and the state and the feds differ on the standards. Now one can argue about what the standards should be, but the federal EPA is based, once again, on the Commerce Necess Necessary and Proper Clauses and on Wickard v. Filbert. In other words, uh, it is based upon clauses in the Constitution which do not authorize the, most of what the Environmental Protection Agency does. One can certainly argue that there should be an Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and a lot of us would entertain amendments to the Constitution giving it that authority, the simple fact is that uh, the environment is not commerce. And even if it has some effect on con commerce, that effect is not sufficient to uh, provide authority for the regulations that intrude into all of our lives in the way that those do. Uh, a nullification commission would make businesses have to choose between the state standards and the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. And right now, a lot of them support the Federal Environmental Protection Agency because the environmental regulations are actually designed with their support to suppress their small competitors for the same reason that uh, businesses ever since 1886 have supported all kinds of federal regulations of, quote, commerce, unquote. Uh, it is easier for large organizations to meet those requirements than for small or newer organizations. So the practical effect of it, and, the main, and for their viewpoint, the main purpose of it, is to put their small competitors out of business and enable them to uh, achieve a monopoly or at least oligopoly over the market. And one of the major driving forces for corporations to become larger and larger and less and less accountable is the effect of regulations suppressing small competition. Uh, most federal enforcement, however, is administrative, so juries do not get to decide, except for criminal cases. And uh, that leaves the problem that if a state refuses to cooperate with administrative actions, what can it actually do? So that there are armies of administrators Many of most, many if not most of them, are not even in the state, doing their thing, and largely out of reach of the state, even if it could figure out who, who, who they are. 
So uh, most of that does not lend itself well to this approach. Now let's look at a favorite, which is instructive because it points the way to a lot of other federal usurpations. The gun control. We've had two major rounds of gun control, federal gun control legislation. The first was the National Firearms Act of 1934. That was based on the tax clause. Basically what they did is they imposed a tax, $200 was the amount as it turns out, on various kinds of firearms that Congress wanted to discourage the possession and use of. Well, one could say by today's standard, $200 doesn't seem like very much money, but it was more than the cost of a gun in those days. But even so, a lot of people might have been willing to pay the $200. But Congress did something else indirectly, which was sort of play. It made it, a, first of all, it made it a crime to possess a firearm on which a tax had not been paid, and then it contrived to have the agency, the Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms, refuse to collect the, the tax. So even if you were willing to pay the $200 tax, they wouldn't take your money. But because now you've disclosed that you have a firearm, They'll arrest you and prosecute you and throw you in prison for having the firearm and it's not a defense that you offered to pay the tax. Now, the next major round was the Gun Control Act of 1968. Now again, this act was not based upon the taxing clause. It was based upon the commerce and necessary and proper clauses and on Wickard v. Filbert. Now remember, Wickard was decided in 1942, which was before 1968, but after 1934. So the, the feds had a new tool with Wickard and its subsequent acts that it could use to pass all kinds of gun control legislation to make it illegal to have all kinds of guns. Uh, now, in response to this, some states have advanced legislation to exclude intrastate firearms from federal, federal regulation, claiming that uh, uh, if a firearm is manufactured uh, within the state, sold within the state, you, used within the state, never leaves the state, that is not subject to federal regulation, and they intend to sue the feds if they try to impose regulations on those firearms. The problem is that you run up against a problem that we encounter with medical marijuana, that the feds can just ignore that and prosecute it in their courts. Uh, now, so the states, and so the main, if we can look to the uh, medical bar marijuana case, the, the, what, the only way that the state could then influence the feds would be to influence their people not to convict if they were called for jury service. Uh, whether they could get the, uh, this to happen with the state merely passing legislation, however, is doubtful. Whereas, on the other hand, a notification commission, by bringing these things to the attention of the public on a weekly basis, uh, would have a much better chance of mobilizing the citizenry to refuse to convict. Now, what else could the states do? Well, the states could refuse to disable the right to keep and bear arm for convicts, or at least after they'd served their sentences. But 
a lot of people think, because of some of the language in the act, that, that that's what the feds are doing is enforcing uh, state uh, disablement of the right to keep and bear arms, but that, that's not what they're doing. The uh, Federal Act in 18 U.S.C. Uh, 922 essentially takes the position that it doesn't care if a state restores the rights to keep and bear arm for convicts, that if anyone was convicted of an offense for which they could serve a year or more, regardless of whether it's called a felony or a misdemeanor, that the federal statute kicks in and it's a federal felony to possess it. So what they're trying to do is to simply use that they're not using state due process as a basis for classifying someone as a criminal. They are using it as evidence for their own disablement, but without any kind of due process. Now, what else could the states do? Well, the states could license interstate firearms dealers who are not required to be federal dealers and set up a conflict like that for medical marijuana. Now, a lot of the st for states now in general do not license firearms dealers. A few cases they do. And a lot of dealers would resist this even claiming it's unconstitutional, and it is. But the, the ploy here would be to use the state license to set up a conflict with the federal government uh, by having conflicting licenses. Uh, it likely wouldn't work if they ever came to court, but uh, it could mobilize public opinion and achieve uh, a win in the court of public opinion. Now, if a nullification commission could find a lack of a militia unconstitutional, and in effect declare that all non-criminal citizens are law enforcement agents, which would make them all peace officers, and in federal statutes there are exceptions for peace officers. Uh, the feds generally consider only a few officials to be peace officers, but there's nothing to prevent a state from declaring everyone a peace officer and pretty well shooting down those federal statutes. Of course, the, the feds might turn around and amend the statutes, but right now that might be a little hard to do in the present political climate. And of course, the Nullification Commission could encourage juries not to convict. So this, this area is a little bit messy. Next we turn to money. That's one of the key areas that has led to a lot of controversy. Uh, some have proposed nullification of the Federal Reserve System, but that's a little bit more difficult because, strictly speaking, the Federal Reserve System does not work quite the way, especially at the state level, that would lend itself to nullification at the state level. A citizen complaint to the nullification commission could bring the finding that only gold and silver are legal tender within the state. The state would then have to tax and spend only in gold and silver, not in Federal Reserve notes. Civilians would then start demanding debts be paid in gold and silver, just like the state does. And the feds would become isolated into a Federal Reserve note zone. They might issue them, they might accept them in payment, but uh, they would have a problem getting the states to go along with anybody accepting Federal Reserve notes as payments for federal debts. The federal government might find itself unable to do business in the state uh, without paying 
in gold and star silver. So, uh, and of course you can see if enough states did this that uh, the Federal Reserve note would disappear as currency. Currency is, after all, what people will accept. And if people stopped accepting Federal Reserve notes, they started demanding gold and silver, and if the states back them up, they could make it, make it happen. However, taking on the entire monetary system at once would backfire. Again, as I've cautioned throughout, a nullification commission has to pick its battles carefully. It's better to take up a complaint from one citizen that our Federal Reserve Bank won't redeem a one dollar bill for silver and threaten to co withhold cooperation on something else until the Fed relents and gives them one dollar's worth of silver. Now whether the, the, the Federal Reserve Bank would do that, uh, it's hard to say, but Federal Reserve Banks, interestingly enough, are private organizations. But they would very likely yield and give them the guys some, uh, a piece of silver. It's just not worth it to them to fight it. Then you do it for a ten dollar bill, then a twenty, then a fifty, then a hundred. And you, you, do a lot of, have a lot of fanfare when you do that, and, and gradually your politicians are big, will begin to see where all this is going. So, this concludes the part of it that I've done so far as a PowerPoint, and we can get involved in a discussion further of uh, where all this leads us. What kinds of issues, what kinds of usurpations does state-led nullification lead itself to? We've picked up a lot, number of big, broad subjects, but what will work best will be particular, smaller issues, uh, particular usurpations that affect individuals or single businesses or single agencies, uh, particular court decisions, things in particular where the, some cooperation at the state level is required. Now, if the, the Nullification Commission could do no more than rally the public to refuse to convict if they're asked to serve on a jury, that would be important and might very well be sufficient in many cases. It might not be necessary to get the entire state government and all the state contractors on board at the same time. But uh, what we'll be trying to do over the next days and weeks and months will be to identify uh, specifically how a nullification commission might address various complaints that people could bring to it, how it could best approach them, and uh, do so in a way that did not cause it to be shot down. Now on another note, it has been proposed by some that the Nullification Commission should take complaints from citizens about state level uh, violations of the state level, state constitution. Uh, I can certainly sympathize with that uh, ambition. However, we need to realize that existing grand juries can all already do that. They are kept from doing that by DAs who have tried to bring them under their control and by judges who are usually cronies of the DAs, but in principle if grand juries were uh, opened up to uh, citizen complaints, then uh, citizens could bring them complaints about state-level constitutional violations, as occurred 
not too long ago here in Austin, and it had a, the result, the desired result. But we don't need to invent a new institution to deal with that. We need to make an old existing institution work. And uh, that's what uh, uh, we need to focus on at the, for state level violations. Yes, John, when you were discussing the Real ID Act, I saw, I think on one of your slides, that the feds might refuse access to their facilities mm -hmm. unless you had a real ID. Right. And one, one thing that that brought to mind is, uh, let's say you're a citizen and you want to pay money that you owe the federal government. Um, currently, is it, is it, can you go to a federal facility and pay off your debt with cash? Well, they, they discourage it, but yeah, the that, of course, raises all kinds of questions because the, it's the feds as much as anyone else who needs people to be able to get into their facilities. What happens if, for example, if somebody is uh, subpoenaed to appear as a witness in a federal case, he shows up at the courthouse door and says, I'm uh, reporting to, uh, to the court, uh, the appear as a witness, and, uh, but I don't have any ID. He says, well, you can't come into the courthouse. He says, well, uh, are you telling me that, uh, that they're gonna, uh, the marshal is going to come looking for me because I didn't show up to testify, but even though I'm here I am, well, ready and willing to testify? And the guard would probably say, well, I better go talk to my supervisor. And at that point, <clears throat> That's exactly, the, that's exactly the kind of conundrum right, that right. I was thinking about. At that point, the U.S. attorney would probably come downstairs and say, shit, we need this guy to testify. Uh, you, you know, I, I, know what he, I know who he is. I'll just let him in on my say-so. Uh, and, he, and of course, the guard, the guard would say, but sir, uh, we're not supposed to let anybody in who doesn't have a real ID. Well, the guy has maybe a, a Texas driver's license, yeah, but, not a, but not a real ID. But not a real ID. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they're, in a, they're in a bind. They're in, in effect, it becomes unworkable for in several, several levels. Uh, a lot of people, when they heard that, gee, we won't be allowed into federal facility, gee, I don't want to go into federal facility anyway. That doesn't hurt me one bit. So, the, the, the Congress is in a, the usual position of uh, having us being able to say, be careful what you ask for. This Wickard case sounds, sounds like it was pretty bad. Wickard versus Filburn. And uh, I'm surprised that the Supreme Court has not overturned it since then. Well, far from overturning it, they have built upon it and built upon it and built upon it. Until now, there's a huge flood of cases of precedents built upon it, which you could not really overturn without an amendment. At, well, at this no, point, we're no, going to have to amend the Constitution. The Supreme Court could overturn. In principle, it could, but sure. it won't. They're a conservative institution, and from their viewpoint, if they overturn Wickard, or a case built on Wickard, they would be faced with having to overturn all of this other, these other cases. Yeah. It would mean literally thousands of cases, and they can only handle about 80 or 90 a year. So they wouldn't be able to get anything else done. Well, they have, they, they choose their cases so they can choose what, whatever they want to get done. Yes. And I, I, it would be lovely to see them in that position. But I, I know the, the, the Supreme Court well enough to know that they're, they're just not going to do that. We'd have to completely replace them with a whole new set of people. And the number, the likelihood of appointing libertarians to the U.S. Supreme Court 
is not very great. Since I haven't been present for your previous discussions of uh, nullification commissions, I'm not familiar with your proposals for how they should be chosen or elected. Okay. Um, how the members should be chosen and elected. In my proposal, I proposed that it be a, a, a panel of 23, which is a standard size for a grand jury, that they be chosen from a pool of at least 230, larger if possible, of people who have, are knowledgeable in the law but are not lawyers. Uh, that could be paralegals, it could be, uh, well, it could be judges. Judge, judges don't have to be lawyers in principle. But, uh, uh, well, now come, come to think of it, I excluded judges too. All right. Uh, or it could be legal historians. Now, of course, my favorites are legal historians. Because I think that as a academic uh, field, there are more legal historians are more faithful to the Constitution than, than most lawyers are. If you were to pick people from, professors from law schools and prof professors of history who specialize in legal history, at random, you would get more fidelity to the Constitution than the legal historians. In particular, you would have a, you would be more likely to get uh, people with the ability to analyze the legal issues the way I think they need to be. If you're trying to understand what the original understanding as opposed to just the last president. So, uh, from that point of view, I would say that it would be a challenge to come up with 230 qualified people in the whole entire state of Texas. But of course, hopefully, the, uh, uh, the field would be expanded if there was felt that there was a uh, an interest in it. They, of course, it could include law students, uh, which would, they would make a pretty pretty good candidate pool. Uh, they're not lawyers yet, so they're they're still young and fresh and un perhaps unimpressed by all the indoctrination that they're about to get. So then you have this pool of 230. How would the members of the grand of the commission be chosen from that pool? At random. And how would the pool be chosen? Okay, well, there are several possibilities. One would be to have a few state officials appoint them, just drawing from as many as they could find, uh, throwing them all into one big pool. Another way would just be to pick them at random from the, from, uh, from the voters. Now, the first such selection randomly from the voters wouldn't get you people who are knowledgeable about them in the law. But what you can do is pick a large panel whose job it is is then to pick the ones who are more knowledgeable in the law than they are. And this could go to several rounds. So you could have one panel picking a second panel, picking a third panel, until you finally get down to a pool from which you pick the final panel. Uh, so basically all, their, their whole job would be to figure out who is most knowledgeable about uh, the law and the Constitution. So this, this kind of multi-level sortition uh, process is one that has actually been used historically. It was used by the city, the state of Venice, for 760 years, although the method evolved somewhat during the, over that period, to select their chief executive, the Doge. And a lot of people think the Doge was a kind of elected king, but he wasn't. He was an executive official, more like a prime minister, and the design objective for a selection process was 
to avoid undue influence by any of the large, powerful families. There were about a dozen powerful families who were as liable as not to go to war with one another, or certainly to assassinate with one another if they didn't get their way. So the Doge was intended to be a neutral figure, not under the control of any of them. And of course they, they looked at election, they looked at appointment, who was going to appoint a guy? An election isn't going to work because the, the big family would just pay off people to vote for their guy. So they adopted a system which had actually first been used in ancient Greece of random selection or sortition. And they had a multi-level process. They started out with a large pool which selected a large smaller pool, randomly selected the next level, those who filtered out some, then they did another random selection, so they alter, altered a filtering process and a random selection process. Until what they wound up with was one guy who was not, did not owe his job to any powerful interest. There was enough randomness in the process, but also enough filtering for uh, skills that they wound up generally with pretty good candidates. In fact, yeah, that's I, interesting. I've never heard of that process. Yeah. Yeah, it's described on our website. You go to constitution.org and click on selection and removal, and then scroll down to the, the sortition option, and you'll click on. You'll see a, a list of articles on sortition, and the very first article is an article about how Venice did it for 760 years. And if you read about the history of Venice through that period, uh, they were remarkably well governed. They almost never chose a, ba a bad doge. He was almost always what, from our viewpoint, for, with the advantage of hindsight, would have been probably pretty much the best selection they could have made, objectively. So, they lived in relative peace and prosperity for a very long period of time. They were finally conquered from outside, but it, they, they didn't fall from within. It wasn't a case of internal corruption and decay that did it for them. What do you think about repealing the amendment that calls for popular election of senators? Uh, I think it's a bad idea. I understand the motive for it, but... In, in relation to trying to preserve a little bit more state rights. Yeah, the problem is it never worked that way. Uh, by the time it was adopted, it was possible for, according to one report I read, uh, a big interest, like the railroads or oil or steel, to buy a U.S. Senator for as little as $2,000, spread in bribes to as many as, as few as four or five key state legislators. See, the state legislatures of the time mostly didn't care what Congress did. That was before Congress was sending large amounts of money to the states. And they were not, in general, passing very many laws that the states objected to, because they just weren't passing that many laws. Uh, so the states did not feel particularly threatened, except on a few issues. Uh, but that could mostly be achieved without, it, did, it didn't matter whether the senator was uh, elected by the legislature or popularly. But there was a problem of corruption. The tendency for the state legislature was to get rid of their least popular members by making them U.S. Senators. If you had a guy who just wouldn't go along with the other corrupt state, Senate, state legislators, say, oh, I don't know what to do with him. He's, he, 
he's too, too goody for us, let's make him a U.S. Senator. Or maybe he was just the most corrupt member among them. Eh, that guy is, uh, he's playing with the women, he's gambling, he's, he's taking bribes, he's, you know, sooner or later he's going to make us look bad. I know what we can do, we'll make him a U.S. Senator. By the time that the 17th, so-called 17th Amendment, because it may not have been the 17th, was adopted, most states were already yielding to popular pressure to elect their senators through popular elections. And the state legislature just rubber-stamped the result of the popular referendum. So, by the time the amendment was adopted, there were almost enough states were already doing that, that to, uh, to pass the amendment. So it wasn't the result of corruption, it was a result of an anti-corruption effort. It was a reform movement. It was a very popular thing to do away with the corruption that had developed. Now one could argue for various ways of that states could control the U.S. Congress, but that's not one that worked. And of course one that might have had a little bit of effect would be if they had a recall power. But they didn't have a recall power. They only had a power to elect. And then for six months, six years, they were stuck with a guy. Um, so the, the idea is a good one, except that it didn't work. And if we're going to adopt reforms, we need to adopt ones that will actually work in practice. In your view, is our current Federal Reserve System that uh, began with the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 unconstitutional? Yes, but not in the way that a lot of people think. Uh, The problem is not so much the Federal Reserve as legal tender. The Federal Reserve is the problem that it is because we have made paper money legal tender. If gold and silver were legal tender, then it wouldn't matter if there was a Federal Reserve. Because of course it couldn't, also couldn't be fractional reserve banking which is also facilitated and facilitates paper money. Uh, we just have got to get away from making debt in instruments money. Do you, are, are you referring specifically to debt instruments on which the federal government is paying interest or more general debt interest? debt instruments, including debt instruments on which the federal government is not paying interest? All debt instruments, if used as money. Uh, do, you, do you consider a, a, um, a U.S. Treasury note, a, a bill, an old, an old uh, certificate, a silver certificate, do you consider that a debt instrument on which the U.S. The, the federal government was paying interest, or a debt instrument on which the federal government was not paying interest? It was not paying interest because it was backed by silver. See, for the, in that case, all it is, it's just a, it's like a warehouse receipt. Could the federal, could the U.S. Treasury, could Congress enact a bill that would direct the U.S. Treasury to issue money or debt instruments on which the federal government does not pay interest, uh, paper money, in order to pay for all goods and services acquired by the federal government? No. Why not? Well, first of all, the federal government does not have authority to make anything legal tender on state territory. It could do it on exclusively federal territory, like the District of Columbia or some of the, our islands. <clears throat> there was a time when, for example, it, Congress made Indian wampum 
money in some of the Western territories. Uh, you can make anything money, legal tender, where it has authority to do it, but it does not have authority to do it on state territory. On state territory, only the, the states have authority to do that, and they have only authority to do it for gold and silver coin. I agree with that. So the, the problem is that when a certificate is no longer backed by gold and silver, then it's backed by what? Well, the court on its face it says, by the full faith and credit of the United States. What does that mean? Well, what it means, translated, is the power to withdraw through taxes enough money from circula currency from circulation to offset the amount that the government prints or generates. I mean, mostly it's not really printing money, it's making entries in a computer. Uh, so for our creditors, the people who loan the government money, to feel confident that the money won't lose its value, uh, in effect the government is having to tell them, look, we will, uh, for every dollar that we issue, that we create, we'll withdraw one from circulation so that the total money supply will increase slowly but only at the rate that the economy grows. So the money supply and the, the total of goods and services will about, will more or less keep track and will be in, in, in parallel with each other. Uh, the problem, of course, is that this is breaking down. It is broken down now for many countries, and it's breaking down for this one. We are now generating more money than we can withdraw from circulation. I mean, if we drew all money from circulation, it still wouldn't be enough. Because it would, it would have to start getting into the money that it just generated. I view the accumulation of interest on the federal debt as one of the key problems. And uh, it seems to me that that can easily be, a, that that uh, federal debt on which interest accumulates can easily be avoided. Yeah, well, of course, <clears throat> now we see that the Federal Reserve is not the only source of lending. We're having to go out to other countries, so to China, to various so-called sovereign wealth funds, as they're called. Uh, these are all debtors of the United States. Creditors. Creditors of the United States. And they have, or they represent the same problem. Um, there are two ways, basically, to withdraw um, uh, money from circulation: to either tax it or or, or loan it. Uh, you know, borrowing has the the practical effect of creating money without uh, having the tax to get it. Uh, but that can't go on forever. Sooner or later you either run out of creditors or you run out of taxpayers. Yeah, with the accumulation of interest, uh, in the end, that means that the federal government will have to issue even more money yeah. to pay off, to, to pay it off. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. One, that's one of the reasons I think that interest needs to be, it needs to be avoided. Well, interest can only work in the long run if the economy grows at about the, the interest rate. Because the interest essentially represents a fraction of the growth in the economy. But, so, but that presumes that the economy will always grow. If it ever falters, then the whole system of interest collapses. Let's say that the economy grows at a constant rate of 3% uh, per year. I still argue that it is easy and 
good to avoid federal debt on which interest accumulates. Mm -hmm. And good for a number of reasons. Uh, again, let's say, for example, that there were no government. That's just, these were only private players interacting with themselves. Okay, let's say you have people with money, loaning money to those who don't have money to invest in the growth of the economy and in production of goods and services. Um, if, you, if they were paid back the same amount, amount they loaned, they wouldn't have an incentive to, to loan. They want uh, a rate of return on their, the, the capital that they've loaned. Well, and that's fine as long as the people they loan it to can in turn make money on the, the capital that they've borrowed money to, uh, to use. Uh, so they need to get a share and the lender needs to get a share. But they can only get a share in the long run if the economy grows and goods and services expand to cover them both. And if it doesn't cover them both, then either the creditor is going to wind up controlling the business he invested in and squeezing out the, the guy who borrowed the money, so he now becomes just a, a poor downtrodden peon, or the guy who loaned the money is going to be wiped out, uh, or certainly reduced in wealth, until where he may be only become a downtrodden peon. Uh, sooner or later, there has to be a collapse. Somebody fails in that. Uh, so you have to figure in the failure rates of the businesses and of the creditors to, off to account for the difference. And uh, in a market in which you have a lot of individuals, smaller, small businesses, all competing, and of course some of them saving, some investing, some uh, uh, using capital for production. Uh, the control of wealth gradually will shift, back, hopefully back and forth, so that you don't have one player becoming the owner of everything. Um, if that happens, and sooner or later, he is, if or if or even if nothing else happens to him, is going to collapse. And you wind up with the entire economy going down the tubes, everybody becoming poor, having to start all over again, and begin to be able to build up again until, you know, fewer and fewer people control more and more wealth, and we then we go into another collapse. The other thing, so you can have people saving among themselves, small players, and, uh, or you can have savings done by large players. What you have with something like a Federal Reserve System is the government and the Federal Reserve taking the place of ordinary citizens, ordinary economic actors as the principal savers. In effect, they're doing the saving that we should be doing for us, except they're also gaining control of the economy in the process and making most of the economic decisions. Instead of us controlling the economy by deciding where to invest our money or what to, what to make or what to, services to provide, they're putting themselves in a position where they can say, okay, you will buy this, you will invest in that, you will produce this, you will provide these services. And in fact, they're gaining control over us. And if they really knew what they were doing, one could say, well, maybe that would be okay. But they can't know what, really know what they're doing beyond a certain point. Just because somebody is a better manager than another and his business makes more money, that doesn't mean he knows how to run the whole economy. He may know better than 
his competitors how to run that business. But if he gets too big, the whole system becomes jeopardized. Why does Congress issue debt or incur debt on which interest accumulates when it, when it can issue money on which interest does not accumulate? Well, of course, the answer to that is for several things. First of all, the creditors have a lot of political clout. They are able to write the rules, they get the guys elected, you know. Um, but there's another side to it, which is that they got this clout through a series of depressions and wars. When government could not pay its bills without turning to them for their support. What clout do these creditors have? Uh, they have control over wealth, which the government needed at critical times in its history in order to fight its wars and avoid uh, overthrow during depressions. Uh, I mean, there, it's not an accident that when we fought World War II, we did it on borrowed money. Well, we had to borrow it from somebody. It, wasn't, it didn't just all come from savings bonds although some of it did. And they had to go out through the entire world and borrow money from all kinds of people and all kinds of, you know, governments and uh, wealthy individuals and whatever. And those creditors uh, wanted to be able to manage this whole thing. They didn't want to deal directly with the government. They wanted to be able to deal, deal with them indirectly through banking institutions, which of course they can own and control. So, uh, yeah, the, the wealth was there, it just was only available to the government if it was willing to make a deal. So that's why the seven guys met at Jekyll Island, uh, where I have been, by the way, same rooms that they used. Uh, to design the Federal Reserve System uh, to avoid the, some of the problems of the first and second national banks that were uh, brought into being and then destroyed. Um, they, they tried to be subtle and indirect about it. Instead of having a single central bank, they said, well, let's just have 12 regional banks, which are really cartels of member banks, and we'll, we'll, all we'll have is a appointed board which will kind of generally supervise them and regulate their interest rates. But technically that's technically that's all their, it's a private organization. So if the federal government were to refuse to issue um, to incur debt on which interest accumulated. But uh, the, the question is, how would it acquire goods and services? And is there something wrong in principle with the federal government issuing money on which interest does not accumulate in order to, res in order to acquire the goods and services that the federal government acquires? No, but then it has to be backed by something. Why? People won't take it otherwise. Will not take U.S. Treasury money that is right. labeled legal tender? They won't take it unless it's backed by something. Why, why not? It's backed by, it, it, it's a, it would be the currency. Well, and, and it, it might be, be, it would be declared the to be exchange. Might be declared to be the currency, yeah. but the, if the people are not assured that the the government is not going to print scads, scads, and scads of it, then they're not going to take it in exchange for goods and services. But Federal Reserve notes are not backed by anything. Well, they're not, except they're they're backed by the Federal Reserve system.
which is charging interest on it. It only works because there's a cabal of bankers behind it all who are willing to keep it going in order to collect that interest. It seems to me that U.S. Treasury paper money, on which interest does not accumulate, would be stronger than Federal Reserve notes. You might think because, so. Because, because, because Federal Reserve notes, on which the U.S. Uh, government is paying interest, is it paying interest on Federal Reserve notes? Mm -hmm. um, well, when the U.S. government pays interest, It seems that that, uh, that in, in the end, the U.S. government would have to issue even more money to retire the debt. That's right, it would. And, and, and so when the U.S. government takes out debt, that is inherently, that, that leads to devaluing of money that the U.S. government would issue compared to if the U.S. government had issued money on which no interest is, uh, the U.S. government doesn't need to pay interest. Right, unless, of course, the uh, large money interests are able to withdraw that and into their own control by, in the f by having it be interest on what they loan. In other words, the, the whole system is set so, up to be a substitute for backing by gold and silver or some other such tangible item of value. Now, and now if, I'm, if I'm somebody who uh, makes pencils or makes desks or uh, is a building contractor that the federal government wants to contract with to build a building, uh, why wouldn't I take paper money issued by the U.S. Treasury? Well, this, what, what can you exchange it for? I can exchange it for uh, bread that the baker makes. Well, only if the, bread, if the baker is willing to accept it. That's right. That's right. So the whole thing depends upon uh, a consensus of people to accept it yeah. as currency. And, and people uh, would generally um, be willing to accept as payment U.S. Treasury paper money that says that on it that it is legal tender. Yeah, they might for a while, but what happens when they have gotten a hundred dollars worth of some currency, they call it dollars, let's say, and uh, they go out to pay their own bills and the next guy says, well, yeah, I'll, I'll accept them, but I just won't give you as much as you used to get for the hundred dollars. Now they're getting less and less for the same amount of money as time proceeds. And eventually they're beginning to see a pattern there, you know, that if this trend continues, uh, this money isn't going to be worth anything, so I need to get rid of it now. Well, well, I, mean, I need to convert it into goods and services before it becomes worthless. I, I think the I think that compared to Federal Reserve notes, the opposite is true. I mean, uh, I think that, uh, that notes issued by the U.S. Treasury would be stronger than Federal Reserve notes. Well, that's that we need to get out of here, so. Okay. All right.